So let's get started. My name is Matt. Um, before we begin, can I just assess how awake everybody else is in the room right now? So if you are about to fall asleep, please raise your hand. Okay, so there's a few of us that want to go to sleep soon, so I won't bore you too much. Um, if you just took a nap or just woke up, please raise your hand. Okay, so you're ready to go. <laughs> um, who's, and I'm guessing everybody else is in between. So, yeah, I left my contact info up here, and I have it in the last slide as well, but um, I guess we can just get started. So I asked you that question already. Um, I'm assuming most of you are awake and attentive, you have your laptops open, so I'll just go through the presentation as planned. Um, at any point, if you have a question, feel free to stop me, and if it's a big answer, uh, we can talk about it after the presentation. Um, otherwise, I can just answer it as you guys have questions. Um, but yeah. So if you're wondering who I am, my name is Matt. Um, I study at Waterloo, I'm about to graduate, and I'm in their computational math program. So that involves taking some CS classes, some stats classes, optimization classes, um, math classes, because it's a math degree. Um, and over here, I just listed a bit of my work history. So in the past, I've worked mostly in finance. I was working in a, a mutual investments fund, and then I worked at Deloitte, who happens to be sponsoring this hackathon. Um, and then I worked on an equity trading desk. And then after that, I decided I wanted to pivot a bit and try out working in tech, because I go to Waterloo, a lot of my friends were in tech. Um, I gave that a shot and wanted to see a different industry, so then I worked at a bank, um, a big Canadian bank, because um, we only have a few big ones, as a data science engineer. And then after that, I was fortunate to work at a couple tech companies uh, who've recently rebranded, I think, this one. So um, I've included a picture of Sean Mendes here, because if you've heard of him, um, I grew up in the same hometown as him, because nobody knows his hometown by name, so I just say Sean Mendes is my town. <laughs> it's Pickering, which is east of Toronto. Cool. So um, I wanted to take a poll amongst our audience today. Um, what do you think data science is? Any ideas? What's up? Extracting insights from data. Okay, very good. Um, any other th thoughts or definitions that you think might be relevant? Cool. Yeah, that's um, that's that's a pretty good definition. Um, if we take it literally, um, there's the word science in it. Uh, maybe we could brainstorm why the word science is in it. So um, science applies the scientific method, which is like skepticism, rigor, um, experiments, gathering data. Um, and the word data is here because we collect information about some things around us to make sense of it, or as you said, get insights from it. Um, and so that sounded really cool. And being in finance, I thought, okay, I should check out this data science stuff. You know, they have some cool looking graphs. I should um, consider this as a career path, so I'm gonna go learn about it. Um, and I went on to Google, and then I saw this. Um, so when I Googled what's a data scientist, what does data scientists do, um, I got bombarded by a bunch of really hyped up articles. So Harvard Business Review, I think in 2012, said that it's the sexiest job of the 21st century. And after reading that, I just thought, okay, then I better do this data science thing. This is awesome. Um, there's all these programs popping up for masters in data science, uh, business analytics, um, etc. You might have heard of them at your own schools. Um, there's programs that, you know, help you transition from one career to another, such as Insight. So from, you know, if you're working in engineering, maybe you want to be a data scientist, you can go through all these boot camps. Um, you know, things like data science can help save the world, you can work on cool projects, you might have heard of this thing called Kaggle. Um, Udacity now has micro courses on machine learning, they have nano degrees, Coursera has a very famous uh, machine learning course. Um, there's lots of money flying around everywhere, and then like it's really awesome. So that's, um, I guess my, that was my initial impression when I Googled around and decided I was going to try this data science thing out. Um, and then of course I continued to read and there are some pretty sexy sounding applications. So Google personalizes your search results uh, based on your usage and based on where you live, based on all these other factors of things that you search. Um, that can be framed as a data science problem. Um, recommender engines are also very popular. If you've heard of the next Netflix, not Netflix prize, um, just going out and trying to figure out and predict what someone will like and not like. So for example, if you go on Amazon, you have these suggestions that are like, oh, you might also like, or this customer, customers who bought this sometimes bought this. Um, and it's kind of dangerous because you start finding all these new things that you never thought you wanted to buy, but you want to buy them. Uh, that means they're doing their job very well. You also see in medicine, so you have branches of 
medicine um, and biology, like biostatistics, bioinformatics. So I mean, that sounds kind of cool, kind of badass. You know, you're gonna try to predict if someone has cancer. So data science is awesome. Um, and then you also see it in advertising when you get these creepy targeted ads on your newsfeed that happen to know what you've been searching on Google or happen to be showing you things that you actually want to buy, which is kind of shocking. How does it know that? Um, and then we also have some machine learning problems in speech recognition. So how do you turn data from a waveform of sound into words or predict what word that you said? Um, and especially in things like logistics, for example, um, I'm really curious as to how did Hack the North know how to order how much food or predict how much people would eat? Um, they probably didn't like sit down and do a bunch of models, but it would have been cool if they had all the data of how many people ate, how many people flocked and didn't go to Hack the North, how many people snuck in, et cetera, et cetera, and to actually try to predict that um, just for fun, out of curiosity. Um, so after my journeys in finance, um, I sat down and started learning self-studying, which I'll talk a little bit about some of the skills that I learned. Um, and then I ended up working at a science job. I was fortunate to get a job at Snap on their product and advertising team. And I found the reality of it. So firstly, there's actually a lot of buzzwords and terms that people throw around. A lot of people like to say they're data scientists, um, but it's the reality is that you know they might say things like oh business intelligence, machine learning, um, predictive modeling, um, advanced analytics. Like there's all these things, but it's it's like kind of unclear what they mean if you Google them. Um, you get lots of different definitions. Um, so it's probably safe to say as of right now, data scientist seems to be a bit of an ill-defined job title. So what I mean by that is if you go on Indeed.com or like any job postings board, and you start just going through job postings and seeing what people are looking for, you will get things in a really wide range. So from you need to be reading papers and implementing cutting edge machine learning methods and prototyping them all the way over to you are a statistician, um, but we are gonna call you a data scientist and we need you to help find fraudulent, like fraudulent activity for a bank um, and everything in between. So um, since they totally differ, I've seen things like you need a PhD all the way to, um, it's okay if you have an undergrad only, um, other things like you need to know how to ship production code. Other data scientists I've met don't ship any production code. They sit on a Python notebook, build an analysis, um, and then they build it, a Word document or Excel document, and they publish that. And that's not technically production code. You're not really on a code base. So um, it totally differs from position to position. And another reality is that you might have heard this before, that a lot of the sexy sounding stuff, like you know, predicting terrorism and predicting bad things that might happen and stopping them, um, often is what you get to do the least. So um, a lot of our job as data scientists is to clean up the data and make sure everything's okay before you even consider throwing it into a model. Um, the reason for that is because if you make a wrong assumption at the start and then your model just learns that wrong assumption, then it's gonna make mistakes. Um, and models that make mistakes are not very useful. So speaking of models, some famous dude said all models are wrong but some are useful. Does anybody know who said that? Albert Einstein. Um, he might have also quoted it, but uh, the statistician George Box is often attributed to have saying that. So what does that really mean? Um, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Um, models, um, the definition of a model in stats is like an approximation of reality. So we're trying to, we don't have all the information to understand like the processes around us, like, you know, um, traffic or something like that, but we can model it using information that we do have on hand. Um, they're usually wrong, but you might learn something from those models. And that's a very important thing to always remember when you're building things, that you can't predict the future. It's just, um, like, who would have predicted the financial crash? Some people did, some people didn't. Um, it's easy to miss things. Um, a lot of times at the job, people will go up to you and be like, hey, why are users leaving our app? Can you fix it? Like, can you do some data stuff and give me an answer? Um, that's a big question. Like, you need to suddenly now build a whole framework of, okay, well, what does it mean for a user to leave the app? Why are they leaving? Okay, how do I answer why? Um, how do I determine the factors that contribute to this? I can speculate on it, but how do I prove that to somebody? Like, if it's a non-technical person or an executive and I need to explain this in layman's terms, how would I do that? Um, that I found to be pretty ambiguous of a task, and it's not just clear-cut as in build a model, train it, ship it. Um, and that was pretty tough for me because I was more used to um, very defined work. Um, and speaking of skill sets and work, um, one thing 
that I found useful were to divide the skill sets into kind of these. So we have technical skills, so programming, we're all at a hackathon, so hopefully um, we've done some programming before. Um, statistics, so usually things you find in an introductory statistics course, maybe in the second level one after that. Um, and I can get to, I'll go into detail for these afterwards. Um, business and product sense, so you're dealing with real people and things that are trying to make money and you directly impact the bottom line because you're working at a business, most likely. So um, you need to be able to know how to answer or how to reframe questions from a business question into a data question, a data question into a data answer, a data answer into an answer that's good for a business person or for the business or into a recommendation or something useful because the business's job is to make money. Now, domain expertise, I'd like to mention it because sometimes you'll see postings that ask, um, you, you, they may ask for things like, are you really good with NLP? Um, like, what is your experience with NLP or s signal processing? Because we want you to, you know, take all this call center data and transcribe it or build them all to do that, um, and so on. So to elaborate a bit on these technical skills, um, surprisingly, I found myself using Google Sheets a lot, um, or Excel. That may offend some of you, but um, maybe it's just my personal bias I've, after working in finance. But it's, I found it a really good way to just quickly, you know, take a few rows and poke around and just see what's in the data set because maybe it's too wide in pandas to see or something like that. Um, and a lot of the times product managers and business people want to also visualize the data and cut it different ways. So you can give them maybe a summary set of data that is nice and clean that you've analyzed already, but you can also provide the source data for the charts so they can see it for themselves. Um, that was, I found was really important. Um, of course, as I mentioned, programming. Um, some common tools are things like Python, R, which is a statistical programming language, SQL for querying um, databases like Hive, um, and, and bash scripting just to automate some things. Um, we'll be using IPython and Jupyter Notebook later today. Regrettably, I should have done this on the cloud online, but um, it's kind of too late now. So I've, I have some instructions for you guys after to install this, unless you already have it installed. And things like data storage systems. So um, you might have heard of the buzzword big data. I think you can actually get a master's in big data at some places. Um, I'm not sure what that means, but I, I should probably read into that. Um, you'll be, you, might be, you might see tools like Hadoop, Hive, Pig, uh, Spark, etc. Um, you can go and Google those on your own time. Um, those come up a lot as well in big companies. In stats, some examples of concepts or things that came up a lot were hypothesis testing. So um, formally, you know, if these two values are different, um, if we assume they're if they, we assume they're from the same process, um, is that difference really meaningful or not? So that's kind of um, something we'll go we can go into later. Um, experimental design. So how do I set up an experiment like an A/B test? If you've heard of those, that to make sure that um, if I change the color of this button and there's a difference, like more people will click it, um, if it is biased or not, or if I'm actually deriving a correct result, unbiased result that I can actually use to make a recommendation to my manager. Um, the central limit theorem, CLT, came up a lot um, in A-B testing. I won't go into the details of that, but you can Google it later. And I have some resources that I'll list out after the programming part of this workshop. Um, and visualization. So um, there's a lot of caveats. I've taken an, um, a cool course here called STAT442 at Waterloo that talks a lot about different ways to visualize data and some problems with certain types of visualizations. Um, and that's a whole rabbit hole in and of itself. Um, as I mentioned for business and product, something that was really important was being confident in showing your findings, um, hoping, hopefully they're right, and hopefully you did your job, but now you have to present them to someone. Maybe you have to stand in front of an audience and tell them why they should change the color of the button because your experiment said so, or why users are leaving your app. Um, sometimes these projects will have a lot of stakeholders. Um, a lot of important people want to know the results of this analysis or this feature just launched and they don't know how it's doing. And you have to be able to persuade them that this change is actually going to make things better. Um, and understanding and having a good sense of what is important to the product as well as the business. It's easy to you know, just say, oh yeah, let's throw, that, let's throw models in, let's do some cool analysis, some cool charts, but to a business person, that, might not, that all that stuff might not really matter. Maybe they just want to know what to do. Um, and that's just, I guess, having that business sense. And as I mentioned, there's some domain knowledge as well. That's important. Um, and that varies from posting to posting, job to job. Um, for advertising, um, knowing key definitions, like they also have lots of terms of their own, like impressions, um, conversion rates, stuff like that. Any questions so far? Is still awake, right? 
It's only 9.30. Cool. So um, today we're going to analyze the data set. And for the purposes of today's talk, not trying to be edgy or anything, but there is an interesting data set that you can find on Kaggle called the Global Terrorism Database. Um, is anyone here from the Canadian Securities Establishment or something like that? Or the military? <laughs> okay, good. Just, just checking. So this data set is public, and it was collected from media articles. So in short, um, this data set can be found on Kaggle, as I said. And it's just a database of about 45 years of terrorist events that have occurred globally. Um, and I will go into the details next on what terrorism actually means. So in this data set, here's the definition of what terrorism is. So it is the threat or actual use of illegal force and violence by a non-state actor to attain a political, economic, religious, or social goal through fear, coercion, or intimidation. Um, and the reason why I picked this data set is because it is a very rich and complex data set that can still fit on your laptop. It's a pretty, it's got a lot of columns. Um, so we have features that are temporal, so things that happen over time, so events that happened in 1970, and it can happen 2016. Um, categorical variables, like the type of terrorist attack that occurred, or the type of situation it was, um, that is a form of categorical variable. Um, you have numerical variables, like the total property damage, number of people wounded, number of hostages taken, et cetera, et cetera, all these sort of morbid things. Um, we have a couple of geographical features, such as the latitude and longitude, or the estimated latitude and longitude of the data set, um, or sorry, of where that attack occurred. And then we have freeform text fields where people actually write incident reports and stuff them in, in a row. So um, there's a lot of interesting things we can take a look at today. And one thing to always remember when you're given a data set or asked to look into something is to, when you get the data set, ask where the data came from. We are gonna see a good example towards the end of this, if we make it to it, where um, it looks like terrorism is on the rise, but you have to be careful because this data set was derived from unclassified media articles. So. That, whoops. So that, that means that if an incident wasn't reported and there's no record of it in the news, then it's not in this database. So that can cause potential problems later. Um, also, it's missing a whole year of data in 1993, and I don't know why, but it, but it is. So that's why I put this note over here. This is taken directly off the Kaggle description of the data set. Please interpret changes over time with caution. Um, Basically, um, it could you could see times of, like you know, maybe terrorism is going up or you know it goes down at certain times. Um, it's kind of hard to conclude that's actually the case because we don't know every event. We only know reported events. So um, we have a data set. We have a, a small idea of what the data set is and how terrorism events are defined. We can now ask you questions. So one way we can go over for the slide demo portion is to talk about how to read in data using pandas. We can audit, sanity check to make sure everything's okay, and then clarify what each column means, and I can show you the PDF file that describes each column afterwards if you want to continue exploring this data. Um, we can formulate a few, collectively, questions and hypotheses about what might be in this data set or things that might be interesting to look at. Um, with these questions, they can drive the exploration that we do, because this is just exploratory, there's no business purpose to this, as far as I know. Um, and then after, when we're almost out of time, I'll stop it there. We'll brainstorm some future analysis. Because um, this you can go on and on with this. There's tons of cool kernels on Kaggle already that explore this data. And we'll just do a bit of Q&A at the end. Does that sound like a plan? Any opposed? Cool. So for the workshop, as I mentioned in that really blown up sublime text uh, file, please see if you have these installed. Um, I apologize that I didn't put this on the cloud. Next time I do this, I will probably do that instead. It's much easier. Um, please check that you have the latest version of pandas, um, NumPy and Matplotlib. So these are Python libraries. Um, you'll often see them for data exploration and analysis. And also check to see if you have Jupyter Notebook installed. And if you haven't installed already, um, just Google Jupyter and follow the installation instructions. So I can take a few minutes now to kind of help you guys debug and see what's wrong. Um, and if you're interested in getting a head start, there's a repo over here which you can clone, which contains the notebook that we'll be going over for the analysis. Before the analysis, I'll take a few minutes as well to just go over the basic functionality of Jupyter, just enough to get us through this live demo, because live demos are scary. So I will be back in a few minutes.
And if you're having problems installing Jupyter, please raise your hand so I know who you are. Anybody else? Thank you. 
If you are stuck at 73%, um, just give it a few more minutes, it should finish it. Downloading. In the interest of time, because um, it is 9.40, if you are sitting next to someone whose it is working, feel free to just pair program with them on this and just watch what they're doing. <laughs> um, just to save us all a bit of time. Alrighty, um, what percentage of you have made it up to some point in the readme where you ended up with this, or something similar to this? Okay, one, two, okay, there's only a few people. For the repo? So just go on this GitHub, Matt Reyes, and then search for the most recently updated repo, and it's just this one here. So I'll give you guys another minute, and then we'll continue moving on. And just try to pair up with someone that has it working, or huddle around their laptop if there's multiple of you.
Okay, how many people have made it as far as to run a Jupyter Notebook? Okay, please raise your hands nice and high so we can see. Alrighty, um, if you could stare or huddle around someone who has it working, so can you guys just keep your hands up? Um, just so we can keep moving forward, um, try that. Or you can just watch and try it on your own. Um, that guy back there who just walked in, his name is Calvin. He might be able to help you because he's he's pretty good too. Is this like, a machine learning workshop? Yeah, no, it's not. <laughs> We're not doing any machine learning here. If that if that is something that offends you or that you don't want to do, then you can, you're free to leave at any time. <laughs> um, no AI. No AI. No blockchain. <laughs> yeah. Ask him if you need anything else. So. Um, just to get started on what a notebook is, so I am in this folder, and Jupyter Notebook is a web app, and the whole point of it is to interactively run code, look at what you've done in the past, because if you do it in a command terminal, you have to like, scroll all the way up, and this is a good way to keep record of your analysis as you go along. It's a pretty popular way of analyzing data um, in this format. Um, data scientists will often exchange notebooks online with each other. Um, if you go to Kaggle kernels, you'll see lots of things that look like that. Um, if you're currently in this place right here, um, if you want to open a new notebook and start fresh, um, you press this new button, and then you have a list of possible notebooks you can start, or files that you can create. In our case, we're gonna click on this. So we're gonna click open this and start a Python 3 notebook. Um, for those who have this running, is that clear? So new, and then Python 3. All good? So you press that, and then a new notebook opens up. You can rename it up here. So we're gonna call this. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, just for you. Oh, okay. No, okay, okay. Okay. So what we have here is a code cell. This is a code cell, and cells in Jupyter Notebook are just blocks of things that you can type code into. Um, you will see shortly why this is useful. But no, there, there are no blockchains involved in the creation of this. But the point of this is, if you want to run something, okay, I'm gonna put this down. Such as printing world. No world, sorry. No world. And I run it. So I have code in the cell, right? I press the run button, and it ran it. Okay. So, so, oh, okay, who cares? We, we did something simple. You can also write Python functions in here. You can write whatever you want. But what's nice is you can also, if you want, you can change the type of cell that this is. You can put markdown code inside as well. As you saw earlier in a previous notebook that I was starting up, this is just something else. You can write markdown in here. You can even write LaTeX inside the markdown. So that's... That's kind of helpful if you're trying to annotate some of your work, which we'll see shortly in the notebook that I've provided to you guys. So um, the whole point of this is to leave your output here. Uh, whenever you run a coding cell or code cell, then the number next to it increments to show the order of items that, or the order of cells that were run. So if I press this again, it'll say this was the second cell that was ran. Um, I run it again, the third one, etc. So if I run this one and then this one, um, I'm running here to import some libraries that we're going to use soon. Then um, it says four. And if I run this after that, it says five. So, you know, as I said, this is called a notebook because it leaves a record of everything you've done. Um, now, if we want to jump off into the deep end, I'm going to go over to our big notebook. Please don't be scared. Um, the whole point of this big notebook is to provide a good framework for your own analysis when you take this data set home and look at it, if you have, actually want to look at it after, um, over here. So, if you... Um, when you copy it and paste it and follow the readme, if you've made it that far, has anyone made it that far? Yeah. Anyone? Okay, so we have one in the back. I guess you guys can just watch. Um, we don't have a lot of time, so 
Um, so when you go in, you have this big notebook that's already been pre-created, and this consists of markdown text, text there's even italicized stuff here, um, there's code you can run, and as you run through it, it goes through some of the data science process that I was talking about earlier. So in our case, um, when you run a cell like this one, like markdown, like let's say it, I want to make a change here, so I made that change and I leave the cell, it hasn't run yet. I have to run the markdown cell to actually display it. Now I've displayed it. Um, if I want to run this cell, I press that. And then we're now we've imported the libraries we need. The environment the variables are the variables are now living in the memory, so um, I can access them at any time. So the next thing I can do in pandas, and by the way, here's a description of what pandas is: a Python library for data manipulation and analysis. It has lots of cool, useful things like data frames and these nice methods that we can use to make our analysis a bit simpler um, and a little bit more easier to work with. If you've ever worked with R, it copies a lot of R, which is good. Um, so we're going to run the read CSV command over here. So pandas is just, we just called it pd for the sake of shortness. Um, we, we read the CSV file that we've all hopefully, okay, probably not, but um, we've unzipped into the same folder. And this was because the UTF-8 encoding, when it tried reading in the CSV file, wasn't working, so I changed it to Latin, and it worked, and I left it because I wanted this to run on other people's machines. Um, if I run this, it's going to think for a few seconds, so that star means it hasn't finished running. And I get some error, but this is just a warning. So we're going to ignore this because you can still continue. You know it ran successfully because there's a number in 2 here. So 2 means it completed running. So there's a number. If I run something that doesn't run, so this. Um, there will be a big error message here that will yell at you and tell you that it didn't run. Um, if I was running something that took a while and then I canceled it, this should be blank, if I remember correctly. So, as we talked about earlier, we want to look at some terrorism data. Um, we've imported our data set here into a variable called df. In this case, it stands for data frame. And we can now peek at the data set to see what it looks like. So, in here, if you want to look at the first k or the last k rows of the data set, here k is equal to 5, here k is equal to 3, um, you run df.head, so the data frame, so the variable containing the data frame, dot head, and now we can actually look what the data set looks. Here, um, I have a formatter that makes the table look a bit prettier, so you can see it, but um, in your own, if you run it, you might get a slightly more, um, less formatted data frame. I just did this for the purposes of presentation. Um, there's extensions you can add on to this afterwards. Um, and if we just take a quick peek, what do we have? We have um, this looks like a year, that says year on it. Um, you know, when you look at a data set for the first time, you're just like, okay, what does this mean? I'm gonna take a quick look. Um, there's a lot of other columns in here that we can't see, but we'll, I'll show you how to view all of them. Additional notes, um, all this related information. And you can also look at the tail of the data set, so the end of it. So as you can see, the year that these occurred were just, you know, last year. Um, and if you peek quickly, you can see there's countries, we got, you know, I mean, this is probably like a citation of some sort, um, et cetera, et cetera. So what, we, what did we just do? We just peeked at the data set. We just use head and tail. Is that clear? Is NAN like an Indian flat bread? <laughs> um, NAN values, okay, to clarify Colin's question in the back. The NAN, the non values, NAN values. <laughs> NAN values here mean not a number, or so we can consider all these to be null values. So this is information that is not in the table, but it's blank. Um, it's not the blank string, it is a <coughs> lack of information in there. Um, I will explain shortly why you see so many of these, and why this is an interesting data set to look like, to look at, because there's so much missing information. Um, it's not a clean thing to look at, um, unlike a lot of data sets you'll find on tutorials. Um, I just figured we'd use something a little bit more disgusting because that's what you see uh, in real data sets. Okay, so notice how before we had this um, this abbreviation in our view. We can change the display, so this is completely optional. You don't have to run this if you want, but this is just to make the presentation a bit easier. If I run this, it's going to set um, us to be able to view up to 500 columns in one shot. Um, so we view 500 columns in one shot. We only have around 130. So if I run this command again, so we can compare the two now. Um, here, I run this, and I scroll through, you can see every single column now, all of them. So there's, this was an assassination, this was hostage taking. Um, you know, what was the type of target? Um, this was in the Dominican Republic in Belgium, okay, this September Communist League, 
um, you can see everything. So now we, we've just changed the display settings to view all columns. This did not change the data set that we were viewing, it just viewed how we're displaying it. Does that make sense? Um, another natural question we might want to ask the data, how big are you? Okay, there you go, that's how big it is. So it's 181K long, and how many, uh, so that's how many rows it has, and then how many columns does it have? This many, 135. Um, that's a lot of columns. So if you wanted to select a single column from a data frame, this, the general way to do it, so remember DF here is our variable containing the whole data set in a data frame object. Um, and just to recap, where did DF come from? Am I standing in the way? Okay, good. Um, so for DF, DF we got from up here. So let's not forget we imported it via the read CSV, so we read a CSV file, which is just a common separated values file. It's just a format for storing data um, here. So DF is that variable, and then we can ask it to look at the summary column. Um, in case you're wondering what all the columns mean, I will show a link shortly that has a PDF telling you what every column means, which is really useful, because you want to know what you're doing when you're poking around all these columns. So if I run this, um, the output looks something like this. So notice that, um, I put a little note here, um, so this is something I read when I was looking through the column definitions, that this field only exists after 1997. So whoever was responsible for this data set didn't fill it in beforehand, um, for whatever reason, I'm not sure why. But you can see a quick preview of um, some examples of attack descriptions. So we've just selected a single column and now we're just viewing that column, rather than the whole shindig over here. Next thing, we can select a group of columns. Um, so in this case, I could run something like this. This, I'm feeding it a list of column names um, as strings, so a list of strings. And then I can, I'm only going to look at the first five of that subset of columns. So if I run this, you will see event ID, country, and attack type one underscore text. So based on what we're looking at, this is probably the type of terrorist attack that it was. And the country here is a number, but there's another field called country underscore text. So if you're following with this, you can type this. Now, um, there happens to be two columns, one that um, enumerates all the countries, and one that's actually the name of the country that corresponds to it. We don't really care about the country number, we just care about the name, and then we get this. So we just selected a different column to put in the middle here. Any questions? What's up? Yeah, you want me to do here? Yeah. Yeah, we'll do it live. Yeah, you can just do something like that. And it's helpful if you're doing reports. I've done them in Jupyter Notebook and just put LaTeX directly in it. No problem. Next thing. Okay, so you saw a lot of null values in all the columns, right? So um, one command we can run, this is a really fat command. It counts all the nulls in every column. It tells you how many non-null values are in the column, um, aka how many items are missing per column, um, and the data type that's stored in that column. So if I run this, it's gonna tell me all the column names over here, it tells me how many of them are not null and what is the data type. So um, from my understanding, it seems like Panda likes to store, Pandas likes to store textual columns or columns containing lists of objects as object types. You have 64-bit integers, you have floats, um, your typical data types. Um, we can scroll through, we can see the nationality. This is probably nationality. Um, you can check this later, but all these different types of um, pieces of, or all these different variables that correspond to each incident. So this is kind of handy because now we know what's in our data set. And we can see the memory usage of it in memory because this is being stored in memory. If you have less RAM than this, um, you probably shouldn't be at the hackathon. So for the purpose of this workshop, um, there's too many columns to work with for us to go through in the next, well, five minutes. So we are going to remove a bunch of columns and I've pre-vetted a list of columns that might be useful for us here. And so we're going to put together all these disjoint lists. And you know how before when we selected um, a subset of columns from our data set, um, we just basically fed it a list of columns we wanted. Like in SQL, will be like select employee ID, salary, etc. from table. We're going to do that again here. So if I run this, 
Um, I just want to note that we're only going to keep 46 columns because that's the cardinality of this lists, these lists put together. Um, and we're going to drop them. So what I'm doing here is I'm assigning a new variable called df underscore reduced. And I'm only going to select the important columns that we care about and save it to here. You don't have to worry about what this is doing, but this will clean up any warnings that will come up later. And we're going to take a look at it. So I'm running a series of steps here to create another data set which is a bit smaller and has less columns. And so if I press run um, and we scroll along here, if we look at the data, there are less columns just visibly. And they're in the order that we fed them in here. And what is this? This comes from here, which comes from the sum of all these, or combination of all these lists here. Does that make sense? So we've just selected data and looked at it. Um, if we want, we can delete the original data frame from memory so it's not hogging it, and we can use it that memory and other stuff, but um, this is a new laptop, so I'm just going to keep it for now, but you can run this command if you wanted to. Or you can do this and delete it. So if I were to run this, um, and then I press, and I ran df to see what was inside df, um, it doesn't know what it is, because I just deleted it. Um, if you do SQL before, you can filter for rows. So you can ask a question. You can ask a data set questions like, "Give me all the terrorist attacks that happened in 2001 or 1995." So if I do that, um, when I when I write something like this, this is only giving me a column. Remember, so this is only one column. This is how we select a single one. Um, so give me all the events that occurred where the year was an I year just means incident year was equal to 2001. And 2001 here is passed in as a number, because if we wanted to, we can go up here and look at our data types thing, because we've kept a record of everything we've done. And if we look at I year, it is indeed an int type here. So it's okay to do that. Um, this comparison will um, basically only select things that um, happened in 2001. So if I run this, and I look at the, if the events here, they're all 2001. And I kept all the other columns here because I didn't specify which columns to select. So um, just a side note, if you want to know all the values that are contained in a column, if there's a lot of data, you just want to know like, you know, if it's categorical, what are the types of attacks that could occur, you can use the dot unique method on a single column. So if I just remove this and hide this for a second and I run this, what will I get? Yep, so if I run this, it will just spit out the entire column, attack type one underscore text. So we can see it goes all the way from row zero to 1,690. Um, but I, like a lot of them are repeated because this is a categorical variable. So if I do the unique, it's just gonna give me a list of the unique values that this column takes on, excluding the null values, because there's only a, one type of null value, which is in this case, null or nan. We can do the same for this other random var the variable over here, but this is a numerical variable, so you're gonna get a really long list because every unique value is in here. And this is good to do and check what values exist in a column without looking through all of it manually because you will see weird things like, how come there's a neg negative 99 here? Um, why is there a negative nine here? And these are great questions that we can continue to look at um, when you look at the data set. But if you want spoilers, this means that it's unknown, but confirm that perpetrators were captured. So this is the number of perpetrators in the incident who are captured. You'll see this if you look at the data dictionary later. Um, negative 99 means an unknown amount, but it's known that some were captured. And same with negative 9, and this is the actual number of perpetrators captured. That's a lot of perpetrators. And it also takes on NAND values, 